Hello, my name is Laura Poland. I'm an attorney here at Anderson Advisors and I specialize in estate planning. Um, here at Anderson, that's all I do is estate planning. And today we're going to talk about whether or not you should have a will or would it be better to have a living trust? And we'll go through the um, details of both and compare and come to a conclusion at the end as to which one would be more beneficial for most people in most situations. So again, the topic, should you have a will or a living trust? And why does it matter? Well, we are talking, of course, about the distribution of your assets once you've passed away. So why does it matter? Most people, I think, want to make things as easy as possible for their families. And whether or not you have any documents in place, a will or a trust or none, will have a huge effect on your family's experience as they try to administer and distribute your assets after you're gone. So usually the debate about will or living trust comes down to wanting to avoid probate. And most people have heard, oh, you should avoid probate at all costs. It's bad. Nothing good comes from probate. And for the most part, that's true. Um, but let's kind of clarify a little bit about what probate actually is. So the definition of probate is that it's a court supervised process for distributing the assets of a decedent. So what does that mean in more easily understandable terms? Basically, it means that um, if you pass away and you own assets, then a court is going to have to approve a transfer of those assets from a deceased person. So if you've passed away from you to your heirs. So the probate process is actually just a judge watching over the process of your assets being gathered, valued, and ultimately distributed to your heirs. And then the next important point to make is, if you have a will, you will not avoid probate. A lot of people mistakenly think that if you have a will, then your assets will be just distributed the way it says in the will. And that's actually not accurate. Having a will simply tells the judge how to distribute your assets. So if you pass away and you don't have a will, the judge is going to look to the laws of the state where you live to determine who your heirs are and who should receive your things. If you have a will, the only difference is, instead of the judge looking to the laws to determine who your heirs are, the judge is going to look at your will and determine who he should or she, he or she should give your things to. So the probate process is exactly the same whether you have no estate planning documents, no will, or whether you do have a will. So please be clear on the fact that if you want to avoid probate, a will is not gonna help you do that. So why do we want to avoid probate? Oh, it's bad. Well, yes, but why? Several reasons. First being that a probate is a public matter. So if you die and you have a will, that will gets lodged with the court and becomes public information for anybody who chooses to go to the court and look it up. So who you're leaving your things to, who you've chosen to be your executor, all becomes public knowledge. Um, eventually, as the probate process works its way through the court, there's gonna be an inventory of all of your assets, which becomes public record as well. So nothing stays secret if you end up in probate court. Um, a probate process for a fairly simple estate takes on average about 18 months. So it's long, and for those 18 months that it's winding its way through the court process, generally speaking, attorneys are being paid so 18 months of attorney's fees, court fees, all this time your heirs, your family, is waiting to have access to your assets, and they won't until the judge finally says, here's an order saying who to distribute to. So long, expensive, again, no distribution. Your family doesn't have access to your assets until the judge says so, and that's not until the very end. So things are tied up for those 18 months or more. Um, if you have a more complicated estate, meaning perhaps you have businesses 
or multiple real properties that need to be sold. Anything like that that jumps out of the ordinary is going to cause that 18 months to be even longer. And again, those assets are tied up for as long as it takes to work its way through the process. Um, and another important point to make, I mentioned real properties that um, have to be probated. So if you die and you own land or houses or anything like that, um, the judge will have to supervise the sale of that asset if necessary. But if you own real property in multiple states, there would have to be a probate in each of the states where you own property. So not only is one probate long and expensive and complicated and emotional for your family, now if you own property in multiple states, that's multiplied by however many states they're going to be probating those properties in. So we can sum it up by saying probate is bad, but these are really kind of the reasons why. So basically long, expensive, control comes away from anyone you've chosen and lands in the lap of the judge and the courts. So what's the difference between a will and a living trust? So like I mentioned before, a will simply tells a judge who you want your assets to be given to after you die. That's it. A living trust is totally different. A living trust is a way to avoid probate, and the way that works is the living trust is created. You, as the creator, will transfer ownership of your assets out of your name and into the name of the trust. So you're no longer the owner. And remember, that's the trigger for probate. Dying and owning assets is the trigger for probate. So we create a scenario with the living trust where you don't own any assets at the time that you pass away. You create the living trust, you transfer your assets to it, and then while you're alive and able, meaning you have the mental capacity to manage your assets, while you are alive and able, you serve as the trustee of your trust. There is a long list in any trust agreement of powers that are given to whoever is acting as the trustee of the trust. So you'll have those powers. And the reality is that once you transfer ownership of your assets to the trust and you act as trustee, your day-to-day -day activities are not going to change. You don't give up any control over your assets by transferring them to the trust. You just manage them as you do now, meaning that whatever you can do today as the owner of your asset, you would be able to do once you had a trust, you would just do it using one of the powers that you had as the trustee of your trust. So as long as you're alive and able, you're the trustee. And then what happens is in your trust document, you will have named someone to be your successor trustee. And that's the person that you select to step into your shoes after you're gone. That person would have all of the same powers that you had while you were the trustee of your trust. And your successor trustee's job is twofold a little bit. He or she would step up, take control of all of your assets, manage them in the short term. It's called garner and protect your assets in the short term, basically making sure that nothing suffers from neglect after you're gone. But then your successor trustee is also the person who ultimately will be responsible for making distributions to your beneficiaries according to the provisions that you put in your trust. So that's an important difference between the will and the trust. A will tells the judge who to give your things to. Once the probate matter is done, the judge is gonna sign an order and they're gonna distribute everything to those people. A trust allows you a lot more control over not only who your beneficiaries are, but how and when and what they're going to receive in terms of the distribution of your assets. Okay, so your successor trustee is the person that will make that happen, but that person is bound by the provisions that you've put in your trust. So you have all of the control, and that can't be changed once you're gone. So when you have assets in your living trust, meaning that you've funded your trust, and funding your trust just simply means transferring the title, the ownership of your assets out of your individual name and into the name of the trust, once you've done that, then your trustee steps up, administers, manages everything, and makes distributions according to the provisions. And you have basically four different distribution schemes that you can use. Within those different schemes, you can be very creative. But basically, there are four different ways that assets can be distributed through a trust. 
The first one is outright. Your beneficiaries may be grown, they may be financially responsible and sophisticated, and you're okay with them receiving a lump sum distribution of whatever it is they're entitled to after you're gone. So that would be an outright distribution. So your trustee would gather everything, value it, divide it into shares for the people that you've named as your beneficiaries, and then make the distribution. But sometimes there are scenarios where maybe you have younger beneficiaries, maybe they're minors, and you don't want them to receive an outright distribution at the time you pass away. So we can parcel out the distributions at different ages. So basically, if you have minor beneficiaries, your trustee would have discretion to make support type distributions to them while they're minors, but then they wouldn't receive any actual lump sum distributions until they reach certain age that you determine. So you could say, once my beneficiaries reach age 25, they get their distribution. But some people don't like to have a lump sum distribution even once the kids have reached whatever age you choose. And in that case, we can parcel it out over time. You can pick percentages and ages at which your beneficiaries will receive their distributions. So for example, uh, you might say that your beneficiaries would receive one third of their distribution at age 21, another one third of their distribution at age 25, and then the remaining balance of their share when they reach age 30. So kind of just protecting younger beneficiaries from receiving a huge distribution and running out and buying a red Ferrari and throwing a big party for all their friends. So if you want to rest easy that you've protected against that, the parceling out at ages is a good way to do that. Um, if you live long enough that your beneficiaries pass the maximum age that you've set, which pretty much everybody's plan is to live until their beneficiaries get much older. So if you achieve that and your beneficiaries all pass that, say, age 30, which was the final distribution age, then they would just receive an outright distribution at that point, at whatever age they were at the time that you passed away. Um, in some scenarios, you may not want to ever give your beneficiaries a lump sum in which case instead of tying the distributions to ages, we can tie the distributions to intervals after your passing. So for example, regardless of how old your beneficiaries are, you might say that you want them to receive 25% of their share at the time that you pass away, another 25% two years later, another 25% two years later, and then again two years after that. So meaning that they're never going to receive one big chunk, it's going to be parceled out over time based on the time that you pass and then the number of years that you choose. So again, within these distribution schemes, you pick percentages, you can pick ages. Um, really, I always tell people, as long as it's legal, we can do it. You have to balance out the um, ease of administration. Um, when someone, a client comes to me and says they want to give their beneficiaries 1% per year, for 100 years, I'm going to probably try to talk that person out of that. And not because it can't be done, but because it's administratively burdensome. Your successor trustee is the person who has to carry out your wishes. So as you're coming up with your distribution ideas, you do need to keep that in mind. But basically, at, at ages or at intervals, you can pick the percentages and so forth. Um, another way that principal can be distributed is actually by it not being distributed. This is what we call a legacy trust or a generational trust. So if you have assets that generate a fair amount of income on a regular basis, you may decide that you don't ever want those assets to be distributed. You just want your beneficiaries to have the benefit of receiving that income on an ongoing basis. So what we would do is create a legacy trust say, stating that the principal assets will always remain owned by the trust and your trustee would simply then on a semi-annual or annual basis, whatever you decide, would distribute the income, the net operating income generated by your assets to your beneficiaries. And as long as your assets are held in trust and just income is being distributed, this can go on for great length of time, meaning that you could 
provide income to your children and then to your grandchildren and then to their children and so on. So what, which is why it's called a legacy trust. Um, in the state of Nevada, uh, a trust can last for up to 365 years. So um, if your trust is written to Nevada law, which it would be if we created it here at Anderson, basically it can go on for many generations as long as those assets are still viable and generating income that can be distributed. So, so those are the four, kind of like I said, basic schemes for distribution. Um, and then you get to be creative within those schemes. Um, living trusts can do other things to protect your beneficiaries as well. So you do get to say who your beneficiaries are, how and when they're gonna receive their distributions, what they're gonna receive. Um, but there are some other provisions that actually are within a living trust that can even protect your beneficiaries further. The first provision is called a spendthrift provision, and that would be in any trust that we create. And basically it just says that until your beneficiary actually receives distribution of their share, that they, it's not theirs. And as a result, they are not able to use their anticipated distribution um, as collateral um, or anything like that. They can't encumber it in any way because it's not theirs yet, not until it's been distributed to them. And the flip side of that is if your beneficiary is in a scenario where they have creditors pursuing them, perhaps they filed a bankruptcy, maybe they're getting divorced, uh, maybe there's a judgment against them, anything like that where they are obligated to pay money to somebody else. If that's the case, then again, if the funds have not been distributed, if their distribution has not been made out of the trust to them, those people, those creditors, don't have any access to those funds. And there is a discretionary component built in that allows your trustee, your successor trustee, to hold those funds if your beneficiary is in one of those situations. So basically protecting the funds by holding it in the trust, and then once your beneficiary has gotten out of whatever situation they're in, then the trustee can make the distribution at that time. So it's protective of your beneficiaries in that way. Um, your trust, if we created it here at Anderson, would also have what's called a special needs provision. And that basically just gives your successor trustee some discretion to make payments to a beneficiary so as not to disqualify that beneficiary from any federal assistance that they might be receiving. So for instance, if you have a beneficiary who's receiving disability payments or um, Medicaid or any other needs-based government assistance, a large inheritance could disqualify them from receiving those benefits. So there's language in the trust that allows your trustee to make distributions in a way so that they don't become disqualified. And it's just basically parceling it out for special needs rather than in any set time or age or anything like that. So, and again, if you just had a will and a judge said, this probate is done, make the distributions, there's no protection for your beneficiaries. They would receive that lump sum and then have to deal with the agencies um, who are looking at their needs and at their asset level. Um, so those two provisions are always in the trust that I create. There are some other ones that I talk to people about based on their specific scenarios. Um, the first one, I have a lot of clients who are worried about their child's spouse having access to the inheritance when the time comes. I can write a provision into your trust that would state that prior to receiving any distributions, that your beneficiary would be required to create what's called a separate property trust. And it's basically just their own living trust, but it allows them to keep their inheritance, which is always separate property, as long as your beneficiary takes pains to maintain it that way as separate property. So let me say that again. Um, an inheritance is always separate property until your beneficiary does something to make it not, meaning they jump it into, dump it into a joint checking account with their spouse. It's no longer separate property if they do that. So if you're worried about that, then we can write provisions in that would make it easier for your child or your beneficiary to keep their inheritance inherited funds separate from their spouse. So that's called the separate property trust requirement. 
Um, if you're concerned about beneficiaries lacking financial sophistication or just not knowing what to do with a lump sum of cash that falls into their lap, we can write a provision in that would require your beneficiaries to complete some sort of a financial education course prior to receiving any distributions. And again, you are as creative as you want to be with this, if you have been through some sort of a financial education course that you have found valuable, we can make that the requirement. Your, trust, uh, your beneficiaries have to go through the same course. Um, if you just want to make it more general, then it's discretionary. Your successor trustee would have the option to decide which financial education courses would be acceptable to fulfill that requirement. Okay, and the last one is I can write a provision into your trust that would give your successor trustee discretion to require a drug, drug test prior to making any distributions. And again, discretionary, not mandatory. Only if your successor trustee suspects that one of your beneficiaries might be having an issue with some sort of an addiction, could they make that request for the drug test. And I look at that as a protection. So it's not a punishment. It's more of a protection. We do not want to give a lump sum of cash to someone who's having these issues who might use it to hurt themselves. We want to provide them with funds to rehabilitate themselves, um, maintain support while they're going through that rehabilitation process, but not have access to a lump sum of cash if they're still kind of working their way through those issues. So that, again, is discretionary with your successor trustee. He or she would decide if they have gotten to a point in life where they are able to receive their distribution and then and they would do it at that point. So basically, what this boils down to in the conversation as to whether a will or a living trust is better is how much control do you want? Um, by having a will, you give yourself a minimum of control. You basically just get to say who's going to receive your assets. So who judge, who the judge is going to give your stuff to, basically. Um, by having a living trust, you get to add all of these other provisions in if you want to. Um, all kinds of other things, specific gifts, um, things that you can add in that are important to you. Um, and your successor trustee would carry out your wishes afterwards. So we can protect your beneficiaries, we can carry out your wishes, and the living trust is created while you're alive, so you get to see it in action. So a will, you don't know until you're gone whether or not it's gonna work, and if you're gone, you don't know. So you just kind of put your trust in a document and kind of hope that it doesn't cause your family grief because it's not written right or there's, it's ambiguous or whatever. Whereas with the trust, it's kind of an ongoing changing document if you want it to be while you're alive. Um, you know, maybe you have younger beneficiaries now and you're gonna put all of these really strong protections in, but then you live 25, 30, 40 more years and your beneficiaries are grown and they don't need all of those protections anymore. You can amend your trust and change it. So as long as you're alive, this trust is up to you. You can make changes. You can make sure that it always represents your wishes and the needs of your beneficiaries at any given time. So I basically can say with a fair amount of certainty that if you own assets, that a living trust is going to be beneficial for you. A will will get the job done, but not in any kind of way that's gonna be easy for your family, not in any kind of way that gives you any say beyond the bare minimum as to what happens with your assets. So if you want to avoid probate, which we kind of established is desirable, and you have assets that would eventually find their way to probate if you didn't have a living trust, then I urge you to consider creating a living trust. If you would like to talk to me in more detail, um, tell me your situation, have me make some more suggestions as to what would work for your family, for your assets, so forth, I would be happy to talk with you further. Um, you can see our phone number is on the screen. Please give us a call at our 800 number, 800-706-4741. And um, like I said, we'll be happy to speak with you and go further into detail as to why a living trust is probably going to be a good bet for you if you are the owner of assets. Thank you.